Well, good morning. Welcome to TVC. If you're here in person, if you're watching online, welcome this morning. It's one thing I'm asking, one thing I'm needed. A moment that's passing, it's time what I'm seeking. Yeah. Like is the air breathing, I want your presence, feet on the earth. Heart full of heaven, see for you. Completely consume me, I can't get enough, I can't get enough of you. Your fire burning right through me, I can't get enough, I can't get enough of you. We seek after you this morning, Lord. After your spirit. If you know it, sing it with me. I'm after your spirit. More than a feeling. Oh, yeah. I don't need a reason to keep chasing who you are. I can see the air I'm breathing. I want your presence. Feet on the earth. Heart full of heaven. See for you. Soon me, I can't get it up, I can't get enough of you. Your fire burning right through me. I can't get it up, I can't get enough of you. Whoa, oh yeah, oh whoa, can't get enough of you. Whoa, yo, whoa, I can't get enough of you. Again, welcome to TVC, and I just want to share with you guys that our TVC Kids is fully open now, zero, newborn, all the way through, you know, when they start to talk. Anyways, they're all the way open, so can we just thank our volunteers that volunteer with our TVC Kids. Thank you so much. And I want to give you guys a chance to, to hear from Elaine Gray, who is our Director of Family Ministries here at TVC, and she just wants to share a special message with you guys this morning. So let's watch this. Hey everyone, my name is Elaine and I get the privilege of working with teams at TVC who are passionate about the next generation and partnering with parents and families. Let me ask you a quick question. What is the next generation worth? Well, here at TVC, we're all about connecting people with God and one of the best ways to connect with God is through serving. Right now, we have an amazing opportunity to influence the next generation by serving in TVC Kids. Because of COVID, there is a tremendous need for volunteers in all TVC Kids areas at all campuses. There is a sign on one of the TVC Kids rooms at the Middleville campus that says, volunteers don't necessarily have the time, but they have the heart. 
I absolutely love that because it's so true. Our volunteers don't have the time, but they make time anyway. We have so much in our lives that we give, to, give our time to, and we truly believe that the time it takes to invest in the next generation is worth the effort. We need people of all ages to come together and serve the kids and families of our church. And now that all of our areas and TVC kids are open as of last weekend, that need is greater than ever. Serving with kids can seem intimidating, but please trust me, our teams make it so simple. Everything is provided for you, including training if needed, and the time commitment can be as little as one hour a week, or in some areas, one hour a month. So it's so easy for me to unintentionally carve out one, two, even three hours to social media a week, if not more, um, so intentionally carving out one hour to invest in the life of a child seems pretty easy if I think about it in those terms. And whatever your schedule is, we will work around it, including working around your vacation time and your family life. And if you're thinking that serving in TVC Kids looks a lot like being attacked and defeated by a giant mob of four-year-olds, it's not. Although. That actually sounds pretty fun to me. <laughs> but we have specific adult to kid ratios that make serving in TVC kids relaxed and fun. So our answer to the question I asked at the beginning, what is the next generation worth? Well, they're worth everything. We believe the next generation is worth everything. And investing in the next generation is one of the best ways you can leverage your limited amount of time. So what's the next step? Well, if you're joining us online, there's a link you can click for more information and to fill out a simple application to serve with kids. If you're joining us in person, um, you can pick up an application in the lobby, at the information center, or at any of our TVC Kids areas. It's so simple and easy to get started. Now more than ever, our kids need you. Yes, you. So I encourage you to take that opportunity today, fill out an app, and invest in the lives of the next generation. You will not regret it. Thanks so much. Well, if you guys are interested, you can hey, go out everyone. and get an Hey, is she going to do it again? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> that's enough, Elaine. Stop it. All right, so if you guys are interested, go get an application online, click a link. And if you're interested in serving in any area of the church, grab an application. And uh, we just we would love to have you guys get involved. And another way that you guys can get involved is just getting connected in a tribe. Um, those are like our small little groups, um, and there's different kinds of tribes. And if you're not involved in one of those, um, I just urge you to do that. I'm, I have a couple of them myself. Um, one's a bigger group, and uh, they just mean so much to me. Uh, in my life, just as far as they, how they encourage me, how we keep each other accountable. And uh, if you're new to TVC, we have a thing called a connection card, and uh, they're in the seat backs in front of you. If you're watching online, you click a link. You can find that on our website, and just let us know that you were here with us this morning, if this is your first or second time with us. And we promise we won't spam you and send you useless things. Well, no promises there, but still, it's worth doing. So, um, yeah, so I just want to Thank you guys for being here. And uh, we're gonna spend some time in worship. And during worship, we have a prayer wall here in all of our campuses. And if you feel like uh, you wanna go over, just write down a little prayer and just put that in the wall and uh, just ask for prayer. And just say, God, this, this is something on my heart. Um, that's something we encourage you to do, not during your worship, just worship, but anytime during the service, feel free to do that. And uh, so let's stand together. I'm going to pray over our time as we sing, as we worship this morning. God, you are good. And God, whatever we brought into this place this morning, whatever is on our heart that is, that is weighing us down, maybe a burden, God, that we just give that to you. We open our hands to you. We surrender to you. And if you feel comfortable where you stand or if you're watching online, just put your hands out and say, God, here I am. I bring all my life to you. 
God, help me understand you more. Help me understand your ways more. Forgive me of my sins. And I know that through the cross, I am forgiven. Through your promises, I am forgiven. Through your grace, I am forgiven. So God, we worship you with all of our heart this morning. We come to you broken, messed up, and you love us right where we're at, God. We surrender, Lord, to you, Jesus. Just sing this with me. is calling Have you come to the end of yourself Do you thirst for a drink from the well Jesus is calling Hear you Lord Hear you Lord Sing it out Oh come to the altar and the Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with The precious blood of Jesus Christ Oh, yes it was, yes it was, Lord Leave behind your regrets and mistakes Come today, there's no reason to wait And Jesus is calling you, Lord Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy From the ashes a new life is born and Jesus is calling, oh, yes you are Oh, come to the altar The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was born with The precious blood of Jesus Sing it out And oh, come to the altar the Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was born with The precious blood of Jesus Christ So Take all, take all that is burdened us all All that weighs heavy on our hearts so let's say Oh, what a Savior, isn't He wonderful? Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen, fall to our knees and bow down before Him, for He is Lord. comfortable just raise your hands as we sing it and oh what a savior isn't he wonderful sing hallelujah christ is risen oh we bow down before you lord and bow down Precious blood of Jesus Christ, oh, come to 
the altar the father's arms are open wide forgiveness was born with the precious blood of jesus christ oh we need you lord we need you lord yeah, yeah. we lay our life down we lay our sin down lord at the foot of the cross lord what a savior what a savior god We need you, fill our hearts, Lord. Sing this. Bear your cross as you wait for the crown. Tell the world of the treasure you found. Oh, yeah. the treasure you our fear, God, all of our doubt right now, as we worship you, you unravel me with a melody, you surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies, till all my fears are gone. Sing it out. And I'm no longer a slave to fear. Cause I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. Cause I am a child.
pomocam în semn A e cea în care e să e, e să e grace this morning and may we take all those fears all those those doubts all the pain and all the hurt and give it to you this morning that we will no longer be a slave to it but that we will set free because you are a God who has broken the chains that has restored that has rebuilt rebuild us God and may we think of you in those moments of discouragement, in those dark moments of depression, may we think of you and your love and your grace. And you will rescue us, God. You will redeem. We thank you for that. What a savior. What a loving father you are. And we love you in Jesus' name. Let's say it together, amen, amen. Why don't you have a seat? Hey, so, uh, you know, I'm not great at these uh, intense conversations, you know. You know I care about you, right? I really care about you, too. <laughs> um, well, it's just like, things have been changing. Change? You know, when a relationship, it, it can start as one thing, uh, but then become something different. Different? No. I will not be broken up with again! Let me help you out with your intense conversation. I sense anger. I had no idea you felt that way. Listen, 5'7 is a very adequate height. Staying in your parents' basement, that's a great way to save money. I am not cheap. I tried being vegan. Isaac Newton was 5'7". Those are my feelings being tap danced on. I had no idea you could be so hurtful. You sing all these mean things to me, and you don't like my music? I can't believe all this. I don't even know. Well, what? I think I've said it all. I don't even know. Do you have anything you'd like to add? <laughs> no reason I came here. <laughs> oh. Perfect moment. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's, uh, well, I, I just got to ask, anybody relate to that? I cannot tell you how many times I have felt like my mouth opened and it just wouldn't stop. And then later I was like, oh my gosh, I cannot believe I said stuff and said stuff. I mean, this happens to all of us. And it's like, it's crazy that this happens because the mouth is such a small thing. It's just this, I mean, your tongue's like this little flap of skin in your head. You know, it's like such a small thing. How could it, how could it do that much damage? Of course, uh, you know, it has been compared to a, a, a match. It's kind of like a match. Matches are everywhere. They're ubiquitous. You see them all over the place. And, and what are they? They're just a tiny little thing, a match. What, what can they do? Of course, matches can have power. They can do good things. They can start a fire when somebody's freezing to death, maybe, and save their life. I mean, all kinds of good stuff. But, of course, the match, you know, just like it can do good, can also, wow, it can, I mean, it can devastate. 
which is something one of my late uncles learned when he was a child down in West Virginia. He'd been sent down to start the oil stove in the cellar below the house. And somehow, uh, when he lit it, it got away from him. It actually almost completely burned the home place down, you know, the place where my dad was uh, born and raised and, and uh, took a life. And in his case, my uncle's case, it actually burned him so badly he lost his most of his leg. Now, the good news for him was is that they were able eventually to fit him with a prosthetic and he was able to walk all the rest of his life. Until he died, he was able to walk with a limp and with pain. And I remember so vividly because I'd be down at Grandma's and we'd be upstairs where she had a bunch of beds in the attic when family would get together and my uncle would be there and he'd pull the, I, I can't tell you how many times I saw him pull that prosthetic leg off and then he would just rub that stump, trying, clearly trying to rub the pain out of that thing from my perspective unsuccessfully because of a match, because of a silly little thing like a match which can do such enormous damage. Now, you know, Scripture talks about the tongue and the match actually as having some great similarities. Let's take a look at this. This is found in the book of James. We've been talking about this in this series. It says the tongue is like the small part of the body. We all know that, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a, a great forest fire is set, on by a small, uh, is set by, on fire by a small spark. So the tongue is also a what? A fire. That thing in your mouth, it's a fire. It is a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire. And this is pretty strong. And is itself set on fire by hell. you got something in your mouth that's been set on fire by hell. It's not last night's burrito. It is your tongue. It's your tongue. It says it's set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, sea creatures, they being tamed, they've been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's image. And out of the same mouth, James writes, comes praise and cursing. And then he says, brothers and sisters, it's just that shouldn't be. It's wrong. But it is the way it is. All this damage that can come from your mouth, from your tongue. So, so let's just start this uh, uh, week's talk by, uh, I'll just do a little poll just to see how honest everybody is. All right, I'm just checking to see if you're going to own anything here. So if you would answer yes to the affirmative to this one question, would you please lift your hand? Have you ever wished to God you had never said something that you did? If that is true, would you lift your hand, please? Okay, thank you. By the way, look around. If a person's not lifting their hand, they lying, all right? Every hand should have been lifted. All of us know that this is a fact, that the tongue, it's like it can do such enormous damage. And some of us, now you can't see it on the outside, but some of us are walking with a figurative limp. And we will the rest of our lives because somebody's tongue could have been yours, it could have been somebody else's, but it set the house on fire and, and burned you in such a way that you may carry that thing for the rest of of your life. Sometimes I think when we speak, and I know this is true for me, I, I, I feel so frustrated by it sometimes, but I think we, like, it's like we open our mouths and we speak, and we're not conscious of the potential damage that we can bring. And I think we say things sometimes because we've gotten away with so much, but of course, you get the right conditions and the right ingredients, and oh my goodness, you can blow stuff up with your words. You can blow stuff up, just the right conditions. You know, I, years and years ago, before I started pastoring, I installed furnaces. It was part of what I did for a living, and one of the things that I had done, and um, I'd, I'd done it plenty of times, knew what I was doing. Now, you may not know this, but when you st install a, a, a new install on a gas furnace, you have to pipe the gas from wherever the gas company brings it out, outside the house, in and then down and over to the furnace, wherever that is. And when you get ready to start it, you have to do something before you can actually start the furnace. Now, back then, it was like they had pilot lights in them. But to start it, you have to make sure that you bleed the lines because from the gas, where the gas comes in at the house to where you, you piped it, 
to the furnace, that's all just air in that pipe. So you open up a union right there at the furnace and you turn the valve on until you can smell the gas and then you close the valve and you tighten the union back up and you wait a minute. Natural gas disperses pretty quickly and it's nothing to be concerned about and then you just, you know, you strike the match and light the pilot and everything's great. I've done it many, many times, but I'd never done it with propane gas. Now propane gas is slightly different in that it doesn't dissipate like natural gas. Did anybody know that? I didn't know that. It rolls in kind of like a heavy fog and just lays there. And so I did all that I always did. I waited about a minute, and I'm like, I'm good to go, and struck that match, <laughs> and it just went boom. It was an explosion, literally. Now, I wasn't physically damaged badly. It literally threw me back against a wall, singed me thoroughly, and I remember sitting there going, what happened? <laughs> I don't even, I don't, what happened here? I don't even know what happened. And the thing was, the match was fine. It did what it was supposed to do. The gas was fine. The furnace was fine. The pipe was fine. The only thing missing was an installer with a brain. That was the problem in that city. <laughs> Instead of using wisdom, I struck the match without really processing and thinking it through. And of course, we have the same problem with our mouths, with our tongues. You have this very fine thing, a tongue, which is a great thing. It can do such amazing and wonderful stuff. And yet, and yet, if you use it without wisdom, it becomes weaponized. Come on, is that true? You know what Scripture says. This is Proverbs chapter 12, verse 18. It says, the wreck, words of the reckless, they pierce like swords. They become a weapon. But the tongue of the wise actually can bring healing. So, so if you're not using wisdom when you speak, if you're not thinking about it, if you're just talking, if you're one of those people like my dad always said about me, now I will, I will tell you that I was kind of, I, I didn't really want to preach this message, if you want to know the truth, because this one is so hard for me. My dad always said about me, he said, you enter the room mouth first. <laughs> you're just talking when you walk into the room. He said, your mouth engages before your brain. And those were kind of hurtful things to say, but Actually, as I've grown older, I realize he was right. <laughs> and it's hard to change those things. So we're in part three in this series where we're talking about the power of the tongue, me and my big mouth, and, and the good that it can do, but also the damage that it can do. And it's all based on really directives from Scripture, which we have seen. And by the way, the first couple of talks that Pastor Dan had done have been amazing talks, and I hope you'll listen to them if you haven't. You can find them online. But it's kind of been centered around a single verse. And let's just take a look at this. And it says, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. And Dan just taught us some simple thing when we say this. Everyone should be, does anybody remember? Everyone should be quick to listen. In other words, open your hand up. In other, you, before you speak, before you jump in and start talking, before you respond, be quick to listen. And then slow to speak. And slow to be angry. And what we've seen so far in this series is that words are not equally weighted. They, they, some words are light and some words are heavy and they can do all kinds of damage. And we have to be incredibly careful and slow with their use. And I would just say to anybody who's listening to this, maybe you're watching online, maybe you're at our TVC camps or one of our other campuses, you may not be a follower of Jesus. And so you're not going to feel the same weight that we followers of Jesus feel regarding this is critical for us to respond to, that we know this is important for Christians. But I would challenge you to, to really listen to this whole series and think it through. Because the tongue is literally a force of nature in and of itself and, and has enormous potential to do good in our lives or to do evil. And so today we're going to read some more instruction from Scripture. And this is really good stuff written in the New Testament by the Apostle Paul. And it's found in Ephesians chapter 4. And we'll jump in and look at this. He's talking about how we deal with our, our mouths, our talk. So he says, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. But only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And it says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So therefore, he says, get rid of bitterness and rage and anger and brawling and slander along with every form of malice. And be kind instead, he says, and be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ 
God forgave you. Now, there's a lot in this portion of Scripture we could talk about, but I want to zero in on just one verse and actually just part of that. And that verse is verse 29. This is what it says. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. And I'm trusting that you understand the importance of that, but look at this second part. But only what is helpful for, would you say the next three words out loud with me? Building others up. Only what's helpful for building others up according to their needs, not your needs, their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Now, I could spend so much time talking about the stuff you shouldn't do. Don't let unwholesome talk. But I want to zero in on this piece, this idea of building others up. And and in fact, what I want to do is I kind of want to illustrate this by saying to you that you are, at all times in your life, you don't maybe think of yourself this way, but at all times in your life, you are a builder. So I'm going to put this belt on, just kind of this, this tool belt on, just to look cool because I like looking really cool, you know, the tool belt on. No, actually, it didn't really work out that well. The last message I preached on this, I put it on, and about 10 seconds later, it just fell off. Someone actually told me today that uh, Thursday night, I made them feel like a rocket scientist, basically, because their tool belt doesn't fall off after they put it on, all right? But I want to put it on because I want to go through this talk and I want you thinking about, this is what I want you thinking about with your words. You use your words like tools. You are a builder. You're going to build something good or you're going to build something bad with your words, but you are always building something. In fact, turn to the person next to you and just say, you're a builder. Just tell them, you are a builder. Every single one of us, we are builders. We build with our words. Now, a vocational builder, somebody that does this for a living, this is what they're going to tell you. They're going to tell you that there's no mystery to building. There's, it's, it's not like anything magical. It's actually very logical. They take materials, which is the things that you have around you, and then they use their tools to create something of value, something that's good and beneficial. They build something up. And they wouldn't have a business if it wasn't good and beneficial and it didn't build up in a positive way. Now, when we get our words right, this is exactly what happens. When you use your words with intentionality, in other words, when you engage your brain and your heart before your mouth, when you use your words intentionally, you are building something up and it's happening all the time. All the time you are building. Now, I know some people might say, well, I just read that scripture and And if I can't, if every, you know, I can't let unwholesome talk come out. In other words, I guess I can't tease or I can't have fun with people or joke around or whatever. I guess I just have to always be serious and, you know, I've got to build you up stuff. Now, actually, you can joke around with people and tease them all you want to. There's nothing wrong with that. The truth is, actually, sometimes joking around and teasing help people lighten up. And some of us need it. Anybody agree with me on that one? I mean, some people, some, even sometimes in church, I, somebody walks in, I'm like, they look like they were weaned on a pickle. You know, they're just like, mm. it's sour. And so joking and teasing, I think sometimes is a very helpful and beneficial thing. The Bible actually says this in Proverbs. It says a cheerful heart's good medicine. So you make somebody laugh, it's good. But a crushed spirit dries up the bones. Well, the, the point is, it's not necessarily wrong to joke or to tease. The point is, is that you are thoughtful about the words that come out of your mouth. And what I want to do today is just very simple. I want to get all of us thinking about what are you building with your words? That's my question for you. I know some of you are like, well, I can tell you what he's building with his words. No, 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 no. I'm asking you, just think about this. What are you building with your words? Are you building others up, adding value to their life? Or are you tearing them down? burning them, blowing them up. What are you doing with your words? What are you building? And I know if most of you were honest, you'd probably answer like I would. Probably a little of all that. There are times, I think, when I'm building others up and I'm doing a good job with it, but I'm going to be honest with you. Even while I was working on this talk, I found myself saying things sometimes and going, why did you say that? Anybody know what I'm talking about? You dummy, you should have kept your mouth shut. You didn't need to say that. That was not building anybody up. That actually tears down. Now, I want us thinking about that because we're always, we're always building with our words. So what I want to do is I want to give you three things to think about. These are, these are like things to process 
when we're engaged in conversation with anybody, whether it's with family or somebody at work or friends, whatever it is, I want you to just think about these things because I think that, that this stuff is more important than you realize. And can I just say this is going to sound pretty hard, but I'm going to quote Jesus on this. If you're a follower of Jesus, this idea of using your tools, your words to build others up, this is non-optional. You are called to this. And your words count. These, here, look at the words of Jesus. This is Matthew 12, 36. And I'm reading from the message paraphrase. Jesus says, let me tell you something. Every one of the careless words is going to come back to haunt you. There will be a time of reckoning. Wow. And then he goes on, and I underlined this part. He said, words are powerful. Say it with me. Take them seriously. Take your words seriously. And this is much easier to preach than it is to live, which in a way kind of makes it hard for me to preach because it's like I know I struggle with this. I, this is hard for me. But I think we have to be continually working on this. So let's jump in and talk about these three things. And the first one we've really talked about in this series, but it's so important. It's the idea that before you speak, before you talk, you need to be listening. You need to be seriously listening. Now, just to illustrate this, I'll use the tool that Every good carpenter, really anybody that works in the trades at all, is going to carry in their belt all the time, and that is a tape measure. And the reason a tape measure is so important in this idea is that what a good builder knows is, is that before you go in to do anything, you want to make sure you get a measure of what is happening. So before you cut something, before you uh, try, start to build something, before you do anything, you want to get a measure of what's happening around you. You want to make sure that you know what it is. It, it, it's kind of like a, a builder told me. This was years and years ago. I was working for the guy. I never did much in terms of framing, but I did lots of different kinds of construction, and I was around this guy often who was a framer, but he always made this statement, and I love this. This was a, a, a thing he told me so many times. He said, Jeff, measure twice, cut once. Anybody ever heard that expression? Measure twice, cut once. And I think he told me that a lot because he knew by nature I'm impulsive. And so I'm always rushing, trying to get it done. Let's get her done. Let's go faster. Let's go faster. And I spent a lot of time fixing <laughs> what I would have never had to fix if I'd have followed his simple rule, measure twice and then cut once. Maybe we could say it this way. Before you speak, listen twice. Just, just listen. Listen. Now, I'm just going to say this, and some of you are, are going to, this is going to hit you, and some of you aren't going to be hit by this because we're different how we're built. I, uh, some, some of you, you're, you're very quiet. You don't have a ton of words, and so you're, you're naturally, you listen more than other people often. And then some of you are like me. You enter the room mouth first. Some of us think we're listening, and we're not doing a very good job of it. Now, can I just say, you think you are. Think about somebody you're upset with. You think you've listened to them. I've heard them say the same thing 10,000. I am sick of listening to them. I've heard it, and I've heard it, and I've heard it. You've said those kind of things. I've heard what you have. I don't need to hear you say it again. I've heard it. Here's my argument, all right? And you can disagree with this, and, and uh, don't email me because I won't respond, all right? But you can disagree with it. I would almost be certain that though you may have heard them, you could hear them better. See, because there's so much when you're listening to that you actually want to listen to. Yes, you heard their words, but they're not just the words. They're the tone that comes with the words. And then there's the affect that comes with the tone and the words. And then underneath of all that is what's going on in them, even though what they're saying may be this, there may be something else. And there's all this listening that we should be doing that I think we often completely miss. Instead of listening carefully, we say we're listening, we think we're listening, but we're really, I mean, let's just be honest. Sometimes I think we're really not. Let's go back to this verse again that we saw. Everyone should be quick to listen and then slow to speak. In other words, shut up for a minute. Honestly, I think we need people telling us that. I mean, it's not polite, you know, and we teach our kids, right? Don't tell people to shut up. 
And that's right. But honestly, we need sometimes to have people who just say, could you just shut up for a minute and listen? Listen, There's so much to listen to. And maybe you heard the words, and maybe you heard the intonation, maybe you heard different things, but just stop, just stop, just stop. This is what builders do. And look, as I said, it's hard for people like me. It really is. This is much easier to talk about than it is to do because we, 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 just, we have all these things we want to say. But I wonder if some of us should just make a commitment. I want you to think about somebody that you're struggling with these days. Maybe it's someone at work. Maybe it's your, one of your kids or your husband or wife or whatever. You get into a conversation and it just goes downhill every time. Just, just think about it, all right? You don't have to do this. Just think about it. I challenge you just to say to yourself, the next time I'm with them, I'm just going to listen. And if I speak, it will be to ask clarifying questions and nothing else. And I think, because I've experienced this myself when I do it, that you learn what you would not have because you're so busy formulating what you're going to say instead of really listening to what they have to say. First, 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 listen. Do yourself a favor. Listen twice. Speak once. And then secondly, and this is so huge, it's the idea of when you sense tension in the air, you step back from this. Now to illustrate this, I've used the idea of a, a wood clamp. So guys who work with wood and they put multiple pieces of wood together because they want to turn them on a lathe or they want to make them into some type of beam or something like that. They glue them together. They use clamps because they know that if you try to put the wood together, like if you glue it and then you just try to use it immediately, you put glued wood that's not really dried and not fully ready on a lathe, you could blow it apart. Somebody could get hurt. It could be a very bad thing. You clamp it down until it's ready to be done. Now here's what happens. And this is a huge struggle for me. Like I said, this whole message is really difficult for me. Is that too often what I find myself doing is I think that I'm listening to the person and maybe I'm even listening to them. Remember, there's many levels I should be listening to. But what I'm also not listening to is what's happening in me. And that I am becoming angrier and angrier. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Because it looks like just a lot of angels. Sit. Thank you for the two honest people in the front row. <laughs> Sometimes I think what we miss is what's going on in us and that there's tension. And we're, I mean, come on. You know what this is about. Sometimes somebody, all they have to do is say, we need to talk. Those are the worst words in the world, aren't they? We need to talk. No, you need to die. <laughs> and then I won't have to go through the hell I'm about to go through because we need to talk. I know what we need to talk means. You're about to, whatever. The saying that came to my mind is not appropriate for church, but sometimes I think what we don't listen to is we don't listen to what's on the inside of us. And so then we find ourselves angry and then when we respond, see, this is the trouble, is when we respond, because we haven't used wisdom with our, wor with our words, we're not thinking about what is the right thing, what comes out becomes very destructive. And the truth is, is that wisdom understands that under tension, when there's anger, when there's resentment in you, sometimes the best thing you can do is to step back not for good, I'm going to talk about that, but just to step back until you get things clamped down and they're solid. So that when you respond, you do it in such a way that you could actually be heard and not damage others. This is what Scripture says, and so powerful. It says, a gentle answer turns away wrath. In other words, it diffuses a situation, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Come on, you know that's true. You know that's true. Who do you think you are to tell me? That's really going to settle things down, isn't it? You know what? You accuse me of this, but let me tell you what you do. That's so helpful in a conversation. As in, never. And what we need to do sometimes, I mean, if, I, if, I, if you could get this visual in your head, sometimes what we need to do is we need to take the clamp and we need to just, <laughs> I 
I actually saw a couple couples look at each other like, oh yeah. <laughs> but it would do us good. And here's what I want you to hear. This is really important. What I'm not talking about is, because some of you do this, you're like, that's right, that's the way it should be. Something bad comes up, you just walk away. Okay. I'm not talking about walking away from it for good, because that never works. I just, three weeks ago, I just talked about this three weeks ago. So many of us, we go, if I just ignore it, it'll go away. No, it won't. <laughs> if you ignore it, it just clamps a hold of your rear end and tightens in. And it will follow you everywhere you go. Come on, is that true? And this is what people do. They act like it's not there, and it just gets worse and worse because they do not address it. People think if they sweep stuff under the carpet, it will go away. No, eventually what happens is you have a mountain with a little piece of material on top of it, and you think it's all hidden. No, no, it's about to blow sky high. You have to come back to it. But you need to come back to it when the wood is sl solid and you can put it on the lathe and turn it and you're not going to bring a harsh, mean-spirited word back. When you can come back and talk about it without bringing the tension and energy that you had on the inside. This is why we read in this scripture, I mean, this is exactly what he was talking about. He said, get rid of all bitterness and rage and anger and brawling and slander and every form of malice. Can I just tell you, this is not something you do once in your life. It's like, yeah, 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 I prayed and I got rid of all anger and malice. And <laughs> Folks, I can feel all those things. Bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, and every form of malice. They can show up in me after about three words of somebody when they say something like, we need to talk. Suddenly they're all there, right? <laughs> they're like, oh yeah, you want to talk? Let's go, baby. No, that's why you step back so that you can let those things diffuse and deal with them. Sometimes people who are self-aware are smart enough to know that the best thing you can do is say, i got to step back from this right now. We'll come back to it. And you walk away. If you want your words to build, you have to make sure that under tension, when you're able to, you step back. And if you aren't able to, that you're very controlled in what you say because that is where we get into trouble almost always. So first, you listen, you listen, you listen. And then you step back when there's tension. And then third, when you do have that conversation, this is really important, and I'm kind of taking this in a different direction than people might have thought, is that when you do come back to talk about stuff, you have to refuse to lie. Now, here, here, here's... Here's why I say this, and, and the tool that I had for this one is the idea of a, of, a, of a saw. Sometimes you have to cut to make things fit. Let me ask a question. Have you ever been building something, and then you had a piece, and you went to use it, and you found that it was just a little too big? And so you have three options. One option is you can just throw it away. Second option is you can get a bigger hammer and make it fit. <laughs> I was going to say, has anybody ever done that? But clearly, some people have. And that has actually been my MO, is that I wouldn't use a saw, I use a hammer. Because a saw takes time to cut, you got to finagle with it and everything. I will pound that sucker in and make it work. And how well does that work? Because... <laughs> Spoken like a true man who would lie through almost any failure. <laughs> I cannot tell you how many times I've taken the hammer in, I'm going to make this work, and then I not only break the piece that I could have cut and made fit, but I broke the crap around it too. All because, all because I didn't choose what's really important. And every builder will tell you this, that it always counts when you're building. This is really important. Integrity matters. Making sure it's a right fit is absolutely critical. Now, here's the problem that we run into, and I just, some of you, this is going to resonate more with than others, but many of us, what we think is, is that if I'm going to speak words, if I'm going to talk to you about something, and it's going to build you up, what that means is it's going to make you feel better. That couldn't be further from the truth. Often, the thing that I most need to hear is the thing I do not want to hear. 
If I were to look back and be honest about this, some of the greatest things people have ever said to me that have been the most impactful in my life were things that when they said them, I was like, who do you think you are? You have no right. You don't, you're not the boss, but it, whatever it is, I did not want to hear it, but I needed to hear it. And where many of us, I think, fail, particularly when you're talking about relational things, is that we won't say the truth when we're trying really hard because we think the truth will make things worse and they'll be upset because we spoke honestly about, well, this, this wounded me and I feel like if we would... So we just say light and fluffy things to make people feel better. And it never works. You actually... You have, to, you have to speak the truth. See, the idea of building others up is not based on making them feel good. It's to add value to their life, to build that which would benefit. And so no matter how comfortable words may make someone else feel, if they're not truth, they do not in the end set them free and, and resolve the issue. You have to speak the truth. But this is so nuanced. And this is the problem because some of you who are kind of like, by nature, more cup half empty and a little dark and a little grumpy. You're like right now going, that's right, preacher. First thing I ever heard you say, I agree with. Preach it. I like that. Because you like being grumpy and telling people where they're wrong and what the right way is. And the trouble is, this is why this is nuanced, is, is you're doing it wrong when you do that. You are to speak the truth. But the Bible is very clear on this. The way we treat people, how we talk to them, is we're supposed to be speaking the truth. How? Can you say it out loud? In love. And with thoughtfulness and tenderness. The, the trouble is so many people go in and they're like, I'm going to tell you the way it is. And they think they've told you all the truth and now you got it all figured out. You stopped hearing them the minute they said, I'm going to tell you the way it is. You stopped listening. You went on the defense. You put your wall up, and you didn't hear them because they did not choose to speak it in love. So you have to speak in love. But you have to tell the truth. Because in the end, this is the problem. See, you, you understand this. This is how it works. Any builder will tell you this. If I'm laying out a building, and I'm a quarter inch off over here, that's nothing. That means nothing. But 50 feet in that direction... If I maintain that course, I have placed the entire building out of square. And I screw everything up because I didn't choose integrity here. And this is what's so critical in, in, in relationships. Now, just because you speak, you don't always have to say, someone's going, does that mean I have to tell every feeling I have? No, dear God, no. Nor do you have to say every thought you have. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? You don't have to. No. But when you speak, it must be the truth. Because lying, see, always compounds problems in the end. It always makes it worse. Well, I just don't want them to feel bad. Okay, well, good for you. That's the way you should feel. But sometimes, in order for things to get better, they have to feel a little bit worse to get to the better. You know, Jesus said, and we quote him so often, the truth will set you free. But, but I, I, I love the quote I've, I've heard over the years, you know, the truth will set you free, but first it'll make you miserable. And sometimes that's just true. I mean, sometimes you, you're honest with someone and you speak the truth about something and they respond negatively and you think, well, I failed in that. Not necessarily. Listen, listen deeply, listen intently. Endeavor to listen to as many levels as you're capable of. Pull back when there's tension so that when you do come to speak, you're saying it in a way that it's spoken with love and gentleness and tenderness. But speak the truth. Because the truth in the end does set you free, even if it makes you a little miserable beforehand. I don't know who you need to make application with these things. In my life, there are multiple, <laughs> multiple things, and I, I wish it was easier. But Jesus said, words are powerful. Take them seriously, and we should. Amen? So I challenge you to do that, and I want to just pray for you now. And 
So why don't we do this? Why don't you stand and then I'll pray for you and we'll be dismissed. And, and uh, I'm, I'm just going to pray that you'll experience God's help with this because this stuff is hard and you can pray for me that I'll experience God's help with it too. Okay? Deal? So Father, now I pray that you would move by your spirit. Help us as we speak to speak words that build up, that bring life, that bring value, even when they're hard, even when they're painful, even when we're wounded, or it may mean someone else may be offended, that we would speak truth in a loving and kind way, that we would listen, that we would be thoughtful. Help us to build life with that powerful thing in our mouths, our tongues. And we trust you to do it. In Jesus' name, let's say it together. Amen, amen. Have a great rest of the weekend. God bless you.